Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Ellen Hertz, I'm an anthropologist from the University of Neuchâtel, and uh, I think uh, without planning it, what I have to say follows very well on what Ian just had to say to you. I'd like to continue contextualizing science communication by talking about three experiences I have had doing different kinds of science communication and um, give you a sense of the richness but also the difficulties because it's not a simple, it's not a simple activity whatsoever. Probably the first element of context I should give you is that uh, I'm tenured. <laughs> that makes a big difference. That is, young scientists have really to make choices about where they put their energy. They have huge pressure to publish, and science communication can seem like um, a distraction, something that doesn't count on the resume. And I understand that. I will nevertheless encourage you to try one experience as a young a researcher because it brings so much more perspective on what you do. But it is difficult when you're younger, and it's also a plea to older professors who don't need to puff out their resumes anymore, though they may forget that, uh, that they should be doing some of this for the, for the general good. Um, I'm in the cultural sciences, which means that uh, we don't have very many facts that we communicate. We have a lot of perspectives, we have ways of looking at things, and we need, um, we tend to be very verbose, we need uh, other materials, other media, to communicate effectively to different publics. So I've been ex extremely convinced by the activities I've undertaken. They completely transform, however, and that's the main message I'm putting forward. They completely transform what you have to say, and you have to be used to letting loose, losing control a little bit of your message and, uh, re and working with different partners. So let me just... That's fine. I'll, I'll do something like this. Okay. <laughs> um, first rule of scientific communication, keep it short. I really will try. People can concentrate for about 20 minutes. Uh, if you want to learn how to talk effectively, follow the Swiss National Science Foundation courses on talking effectively. That's another uh, quick tip. So I will give you everything I have to say in the first five minutes, and the rest is just illustrations and pictures. Uh, first point, context matters. Think about your audience. And I, I'm glad I said that, I didn't realize, but yes, don't take your audience for fools. Think about what they know, what they expect you to say, how to surprise them, how to also give them some of what they expect from you, and basically explore how they are going to look at what you say before you just blurt it out. So that's very important, and when you're a social anthropologist, you should be good at that, but all of us should be thinking about who we're talking, whom we're talking to, and really spend some time on it. You will be dealing with others. What forms of expertise do they bring to the conversation? And um, that means if you're teaching, if you're dealing with teachers in classrooms, they know a lot about teaching young kids, for example. If you're dealing with theaters, they know about organizing events. All of these forms of expertise you really have to take seriously. And this is perhaps good news for younger scholars, especially if you're financed by the Swiss National Science Foundation. You don't have to invent it all yourself. There are experts out there. You will be dealing with people who know much better than you and, should, and will continue to know much better than you how to go about things. And the third point, in many cases, it's worth taking the time to hire professional creators. And that's something that the extremely generous funding, you really have to understand how generous uh, the Agora program is in comparison with other European funding institutions. That's something you can do. You can hire artists, you can hire directors, and I'll talk about some of my experiences. Next, yes. So I'll talk about three very different experiences that I've had. Um, and I'll talk about them from my point of view. What did it do to me as a scientist? What, what kind of, was it agreeable, not agreeable? There's lots of uncomfortable moments. We're definitely out of our comfort zone in some of these moments. Um, one is science as installation. I'll talk about an installation I did at a large uh, museum exhibit for the public the museum going public, called Making Things Public, organized by um, Bruno Latour and 
Mr. Weibel, whose first name I've forgotten, at the ZKM in Germany. Then a second experience, which I call Science's Travelogue, which I had with our, our wonderful co-host, Bernard Fuhrer, at the SNIS. We made a film on research that was financed by the SNIS, and we'll talk about that. And the third is Science's Reflective Co-Creation, and that's where I completely rejoin what Ian was just telling you about the new paradigm in science communication where in fact what I was doing was allowing other people to communicate with each other, different social partners. So it's three very different formats. Science as installation. That's our installation. Um, making things public was a large exhibit bringing together about 50 different kinds of scientists and talking about how uh, objects interact with the public, become part of the public, make collective truths. And we were working on um, indigenous rights and legal protection for indigenous peoples. And we had one simple, very simple message to make. And you can go to the next slide. Legal rights have a material form, and that is paper. And the, to make a legal convention to protect indigenous peoples, you need, next slide, that much paper to create a single sheet of binding legal work. And it took about 30 years. So we did legislative history, went to the ILO and looked in their archives and so forth. From the results aren't that important. What's important is that I, in this relation to communication, I was entirely passive. I had one message and I ceded all of my, the rest of the work to a sonographer, professional sonographer, a professional dramaturge, and to the museum staff at the ZKM, who then thought up something which I was delighted with. I love this installation, but I, it has nothing to do with my expertise, and I really had to let go and let them, and they asked me all sorts of difficult questions. What, in fact, getting to my main message took us about six months. What do you want to say in one sentence? And then we're gonna translate it into an art exhibit. Um, it was a wonderful experience in terms of thinking otherwise, but it wasn't, um, it didn't help me move forward in my scientific thinking. We can go to the next one now. Complex, this is science as travelogue. This was an attempt to narrate two years of very exploratory fieldwork that I did in China, financed by a SNIS research project uh, about um, corporate social responsibility initiatives by big Western firms in China and what that turns into. And it was extremely complicated. It had enormous numbers of ramifications. And uh, Bernard and I agreed that it might be fun to try and make a film after the research was done. So this is kind of elementary filmmaking. Don't do that. It took us seven years to produce 30 minutes of filming. It's, with all due respect, not particularly professional. Uh, we didn't have a storyboard. We didn't have a plan. We had to really re use old footage. We had to go back and do sort of artificially reenacted scenes. There's lots of problems with this film. It was nonetheless extremely interesting and fun to make. Extremely annoying to have someone tell me, no, you've got to redo that. No, you didn't say that right. No, please walk differently. Um, next slide. Uh, very embarrassing in certain moments to have someone filming us as we're trying to negotiate a used telephone. Uh, you will recognize one of your other experts, Alice Sala, who, will, who was with us on part of this field experience. Next slide. Yes, being filmed walking and it's so annoying, you can't imagine. Um, next slide, please. Having to look at yourself in, um, as a talking head, um, very, also extremely annoying, but very useful in terms of talking clearly. But just be prepared for how much, how much wear and tear it is for the ego. And finally, next slide. And a certain amount of artificiality um, as you're in the field where it's supposed to be an entirely natural experience where you're having genuine ex exchanges with real Chinese people. And then there's this guy filming you all the time behind. 
And there's a lot of ethical questions also about using images that you should, all of that you need to think about beforehand. I nevertheless highly recommend it at some point thinking about using video uh, with a professional and planning it a little bit ahead of time and thinking about what kinds of complicated stories you can tell because you can tell longer. You can reduce, it doesn't reduce to one sentence. You have 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you can make it a whole full length documentary where you can really explore how science is made, science in the making, and that's what we tried to use as a narrative framework to say, how did we get from our, our, original, our original research question to our final results? What were the ups and downs? Whom did we have to meet? How did we finally distill our conclusions over 30 minutes? It, you can get a complicated message through. Third, science is reflexive co-creation. Does this mic work? Yes. OK, I'd like to use it because I need my two hands. There we go. <laughs> OK. Science's reflexive co-creation is where we get closer to what uh, Ian was talking about. This was the project that was financed by the Agora Funds from Swiss National Science Foundation. I should maybe mention something about budgets. Uh, the first installation cost about 40,000 francs for transport, paying professionals, and so forth. The second one was free because we put so much free labor into it. But if you had budgeted that with a professional filmmaker, it would have been a lot of money. I, don't, I have no idea how much money it would, what it would have been, but it would have been something. And this was a very complex process. Uh, over three years, we got 200,000 francs and then another 40,000 francs from the Swiss National Science Foundation and we raised another 60,000 francs from other funds. So this is an expensive proposition. It might sound funny, but I think it's easier to do an expensive proposition than a not expensive one. You can hire professionals, you can plan things out. Uh, there, you can get up to 200,000 francs, which is a wonderful wonderful amount of money to do something really interesting with. And if you're going to start, go big, not small. Small is when you know what you're doing. Big, big is when you can get help. So this had a, basically, it was a participative theater project about problems and bl blockages and interesting controversies in the canton of Neuchâtel. And we did it with social actors with the state council, the Conseil d'État, with um, the CSEM, the major innovation center, with local governments, with local associations. We located a bunch of local actors in the canton of Neuchâtel, and we located issues where things weren't working, and we said, we're going to work with you on them through interviews, through discussion, and through particip participatory theater. Next slide. It was in three phases. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I wrote in French without noticing. I meant to write in English. Uh, three phases. Uh, one was with researchers working to identify these themes, and so we drew on our interdisciplinary research center to identify three research themes that they were working on that they knew about so they could guide us. So the second was, as I say, interviews, observations, uh, presentations and discussions with a small group. We created what we called a safe space of actors all working on s single pro problems, problematic. So the first one was about why Neuchâtel produces so much innovation in solar power and doesn't, has so little solar power in the canton. What's going on? Why isn't there any industrialization and any commercialization in the canton? Why don't we capture that value? And that was we worked on with scientists, engineers, and local politicians. The second one, don't change. <laughs> the second one was about um, treating psychiatric problems, especially schizophrenia, trying to get people who suffer from uh, psych psychotic disorders out into society, living in apartments with independent living facilities. How do you negotiate that with real estate? people with local health associations, with city governments, and with psychiatric hospitals. 
And the third one was about um, new regional politics and how local communal politicians negotiate with the state council to create regional identities. So those are the, we identified the actors, we, we then interviewed them, and then what we basically did was through talking with them, we produced small plays about them, where they were portrayed, caricatured, but in a way that didn't make fun of them, that respected them, that didn't treat them as idiots. And we presented these to them, and then we asked them to say, are we right? Have we understood you correctly? Is this a good illustration of what your problems are? And it was extremely useful, helpful, engaging, moving even, and they very much enjoyed it, I have to say. It was an enormous success. And then we transformed all of that well, we then we transformed all of that into a, profesh, uh, a full-length play that we put on at a theater in La Chaux de Fonds. And next, please. So we presented the entire play around these problems and around the kinds of negotiations and difficulties in communication among social actors. And then we had what's called a bord de scène, an after, day, after theater discussion with the audience. The entire State Council of Neuchâtel came, talked about this with us, various. We had five filled out evenings. It was a wonderful experience. So this was the most ambitious, but also the most rewarding, and probably also the most useful form of science communication that we did. Once again, I don't think it's easy to do such things as a young researcher, but I think it's possible to do to co-create, to collaborate, and to respect the mediums in which you're doing this communication, that is, respect the ways in which installations, dance, photography, theater, film work. They have their own codes, they have their own forms of power, and you need to get experts working with you to think that through with them and with the people you're, if you're in the social sciences, with the people you're researching in order to get a sort of creative co-collaborative energy, which then I think has more positive impact than a more unilateral, uh, one directional forms of communication, no matter how beautiful or important they are. And finally, the final message, have fun, yes. You need to enjoy it or uh, it won't work, but I think you will enjoy it if you try it and I encourage you to throw yourself into it. Thank you.